some of this stuff that you know I've read that happened in the Justice Department sounds a little bit like office politics. So I think a lot of people who find out about what happened will say, oh yeah, that's what always happens. People do have different interpretations of what's ethical, what's lawful, what's different about this. It changed the whole culture of the Civil Rights Division. You had a, even in the Reagan years, there was give and take between political and career people. It was professional. That was lost completely. There was efforts to drive people out. They would transfer people from one section to another that they didn't want doing some certain kind of work. But of course, now we're faced with another uh, big question mark, to say the least. And now the career guys are and gals are faced with the same decision. Do I stay and try to preserve the integrity of the institution and of the rule of law in this country? Or do I just throw my hands up and go, I guess, fight from the outside? They'll have the same questions that we had through the Bush years. You know, I was in a position, unlike, say, say a line attorney that wasn't a supervisor, but I was in a position where I felt I could not do the job anymore. If they're in the Justice Department right now and they see this, what would your recommendation be? Leave or stay and fight? I, I would stay until you felt that he, I mean, personally couldn't do it. I mean, in a sense, that's what happened to me. Uh, and what I think will happen is a great slowing down and stopping of civil rights enforcement. Yeah, but that's what happened the last time. It, it happened you know, the last time. No, we know time. now, right? When the Justice Department became corrupted, what is it, 20 million emails were deleted to hide this. We didn't know the lengths to which they would go to abuse power, hold on to power. Mm -hmm. Now we do know. So there's another generation of people who are going to have to live with the legacy of what's, what's what happens happen. right now. Yeah, I know. So, yeah. It's important that career people do stay if they can. I, I would tell anybody that, and I ho would hope they will be able to, but I understand that uh, there's going to be a, a lot of people that do leave. You took this job because you were dedicated to enforcing civil rights law, and if, if all of a sudden the administration's not enforcing civil rights law, you're, you're, you're doing a job you don't want to do. I had been defanged. I, I didn't have any authority to do what I should be doing. Fonce Spakovsky was running the section, essentially. I was nominally the head of the section. I still had the support of the staff, but it was really a hostile environment, particularly for supervisors. It, it's very difficult to hang in there for eight years. When you know you're going to do things that are unpopular, one of the highest priorities for the ruling minority is to prevent the voters from holding them accountable. Yeah, there was a lot of effort to d dig up uh, evidence that there was voter fraud, which has never been ever established. I mean, the, the two decisions the, the last two years in the voter ID law in Texas and North Carolina really put a lie to that, I think. I mean, those were full trials on that issue. This is not Jim Crow. This is not a police dog. This is not a fire hose. And the idea that it is, is a disservice to uh, those who fought the civil rights movement of the 1960s. The U.S. Department of Justice instituted a huge crackdown on voter fraud from 2002 to 2007, a five-year period with the full uh, resources of the federal government. They didn't turn up these mythical, massive schemes for in-person voter fraud. You know, they couldn't find evidence of voter fraud of the type that voter ID is supposed to stop, that in other words, voting twice. But it was in the news all the time. So this whole octopus of think tanks and news channels and politicians mm -hmm. who'd get money from the same funders as the think tanks all talking about this justification for voter suppression, the lawmakers were able to go to the floor of the different state legislatures and say, well, we don't really know if this is happening, but the people think it's happening. And what's in the way? The Voting Rights Act. Well, that, I was just going to say that, the, you know, they were renewed Section 5 in 2006. The voting section always, in preparation for renewal hearings, would do a tremendous amount of work gathering data on objections, what, what the experience had been in fighting voter discrimination. And so I had set up a group of people to do that. And that was dispersed. They said, no, we're not going to do that. And in fact, the Justice Department never presented any evidence to the committee 
supporting Section 5, which was unprecedented. But they didn't, you know, you didn't see Republican senators vote against it because right. they were yeah. quite sure that the Supreme Court was going to find it unconstitutional. Oh, really? In 06, they knew? There was a, a great sense that that oh. would happen. Wow. After nearly half a century, the U.S. Supreme Court pulled the plug today on federal supervision of nine mostly southern states whose records on race relations were deemed a threat to minority voting rights. With the removal of Section 4 from the 1965 Voting Rights Act, states no longer need clearance before changing election laws. Section 5 is really the most important part of the Voting Rights Act because it forced states with the worst history of voting discrimination to have to clear their changes with the federal government, and it shifted the burden of proof onto the discriminators as opposed to those who had been discriminated against. A number of voter suppression laws passed uh, by Republican legislatures all over the country uh, just exploded. All those in favor will vote aye. All those opposed will vote no. You'll have five seconds to vote. The clerk will record the vote. I mean, you cut back on early voting. You cut back on voting on Sundays, which affect, especially affected the minority communities. African-American churches. African-American yeah. churches going to the voting polls on yeah. Sunday. In Arizona, they cut down the number of precincts by one-third or something in the Phoenix area, which was an urban area that was probably more democratic, more Hispanic. Yeah. I mean, why do you cut back the number of precincts where people can vote? The urban centers have these rapidly growing populations, and there are only so many places that have wheelchair accessibility and parking. Mm -hmm. There's only so many polling places that you can add. So as the population grows, early voting was the safety valve that allowed them to avoid the eight-hour lines of the polls. Right. So if you are more interested in seeing the rural vote dominate an election over the urban vote, mm -hmm. then cuts to early voting basically eliminate that safety valve and force more people to the polls on the last day, on election day. And it's not going to impact the places where the population is more sparse. You know, one of the things that, that is most disturbing to me is what Trump said the other day, that two million people voted fraudulently without any evidence. I've never seen anything like that. This is the president of the country talking about stuff that is not true. But it's necessary to make people believe it in order to justify That's the right. voter suppression. But I've never seen, to me, it's, it's kind of gotten to this peak. You know, you saw this kind of hostility to voting rights enforcement. Yeah. But something like this, it worries me the most, I think, that type of lying. Most experts say actual cases of voter fraud at the polls are extremely rare, in part because they're very difficult to pull off. According to one study from a professor at Loyola Law School, there have been just 33 known cases, 31 known cases, I should say, of people impersonating somebody else at the polls out of more than a billion votes in American elections. But Donald Trump is obviously very emphatic about his position. Is there any evidence to back up his claims? Uh, we spoke also uh, this week with somebody from the conservative think tank, the Heritage Foundation, who said there is some evidence. And one of the biggest vulnerabilities also is the fact that while it's illegal for non-citizens to register and vote, um, it's really an honor system. Uh, election officials uh, don't really have a, a way of verifying that. Hans von Spakowski was nominated to the Federal Elections Commission. So that means Bush, knowing... Well, he actually had had a... Uh appointment, what do they call them, the recess appointment. recess appointment, and they nominated him formally. Because, I mean, we think of W and his dad, certainly. We think of Republicans before Trump as these statesmen who wanted to put the country first. Maybe we didn't agree with them. Right. But the truth is, is that either W or whoever was advising him was condoning what Hans von Spakowski and Bradley Schlossman were doing. Yeah. because he appointed him to the Federal Elections Commission. Mr. Von Spakowski and others in this front office violated the sacred rule that partisanship should be checked at the door of the Justice Department so that the business of protecting the American people through federal law enforcement can be honored without prejudice. Was that letter written at the request of someone in the Rules Committee or? No, we, we uh we're, you know, we were aware he was having hearings, and the group of people that were formerly in the voting section felt we should write our concerns about it. To reward somebody who had been
doing that to the voting section we felt was we had to speak out. I mean, we were all gone then. We wouldn't have been able to speak out if we were in the... Okay, so that's one reason to leave, so that he can speak freely. What, what happened next? Well, he didn't get in. He had to withdraw. I think uh, my understanding was that Obama put a hold on him. Right. And uh, that was the beginning of the end. Uh, he goes off to the Heritage Foundation and... and uh, he's a traveling salesman for voter suppression. Yeah, and more than that. I mean, he's he's a conservative spokesman, so yeah. to speak. He writes yeah. about more than voting. Yeah. Well, Alec and, and you know the American Legislative Exchange Council, the Heritage Found- mm-hmm. Foundation, um, founded by someone who said, Paul Rarick, I think, is, and we do not want the people to vote. They want everybody to vote. I don't want everybody to vote. Elections are not won by a majority of people. They never have been from the beginning of our country, and they are not now. As a matter of fact, our leverage in the elections quite candidly goes up as the voting populace goes down. 